employs this very strategy to get us off course with the direction that God wants to go in our lives. Um, he doesn't tell us the big, bold lies that we wouldn't buy into. Instead, he gives us these little lies about ourselves or about our relationship with God that can just derail us from moving forward in the direction that God would have us to go. And so if he can get us to buy into uh, a small lie, uh, a, a disconnect from the truth of who God is, uh, then many times we, we walk away disillusioned uh, and we walk away um, just not knowing uh, how relationship with God moves forward from that moment over something that is a deception. In this passage of scripture, Psalm 139, what we see is this uh, kind of correcting of course, if you will. Uh, King David wrote this psalm. This is one of David's psalms, and he is writing um, this psalm of worship. But in this psalm, he's really talking a lot about the nature and the character of God. And as I read it, and as I've read it in the past, I've always felt like he is correcting course on common misconceptions about God as it pertains to his relationship with us. See, one of the little lies that Satan gives us a lot of times is that we're kind of on our own and, and that, you know, uh, God is disconnected and we can believe truth about who God is, but it doesn't necessarily impact our lives. And, and this psalm speaks to that lie and says, no, God is a personal God. And so let's just jump into it. Psalm 139, I'm going to read the entirety of it, but then we're going to go back and we're going to pick apart a few verses and, and kind of unpackage them a little bit as well. So beginning in verse 1, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts even from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. You hem me in, behind and before me. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up into the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of of the dawn, and if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, and when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. And if only you would slay the wicked, O oh God, away from you, you bloodthirsty men. They speak of you with evil intent, and your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and abhor those who rise against you? I have nothing but hatred for them, and I count them as my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in your way everlasting. Father God, we come to you once again, and I lift up your word, and I pray, Holy Spirit, once again, that you would have freedom in this place, wherever this place is, whether it's here this morning in person or online or, or wherever it is. God, have freedom in the place that is our heart. Have freedom in the place that is our mind. Have freedom in the place that is our life. God, as we surrender to you and as we walk in relationship 
with who you are. Because God, you know us intimately. God, you care about us vastly. And so help us to remember that and to walk with you in right relationship. Holy Spirit, once again, move. Once again, move in our lives. Help us to hear you and lay aside anything else, any other messaging that we're hearing or any other um, detail that we're focusing on. Help us to hear you, God. And so, God, may the words in my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O oh God. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. You see, I love Psalm 139. It's one of my favorite psalms in the entire book, and I know that there's a lot of them there. It's one of my favorite because I feel like it's one of those moments where David gets really raw and honest with God, and he, he talks about the nature of God, sure, but he talks um, also in the middle of this, this understanding and description of the nature of God. He talks in a way that, that gives all of himself to God and holds nothing back. It starts off with this, uh, this statement of, you have searched me, and you know who I am. And then he kind of explains all of that. And then he ends at the very end of it with this invitation to God. And he says, search me, verse 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. He expands on the fact that, uh, he, that God already knows these things and he's inviting God into those places. And did you read the rest or hear the rest of what he said after that? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any wicked or offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You see, that last two verses is a pretty bold statement to God. We know logically in our brain, if we've been in the church for very long, that God already knows our thoughts and he already knows uh, kind of what we are feeling and all of those sorts of things. But understand, even in the middle of that knowledge, David gives David gives God permission to, to call him out on it. Not just know it, but call him out on it. You know, have you ever known a person that you could pick out a character trait in their life that's really not good? Maybe they're a little prideful or arrogant. Maybe they're a little rude sometimes or whatever it may be, and you never tell them that? Yeah, we do it all the time. That's culture. Um, we, we hold back a little bit from telling some people things because we don't want to offend them. And David's saying to God, don't hold anything back. Reveal if there's any offensive way in me. Show me if there's any part of it. And then, God, lead me in your way, the way of everlasting. Uh, so there is this closing uh, prayer of total and complete surrender. I almost hesitate to say total and complete surrender because here's the thing. That is a phrase we use in the church uh, so often because it, it's true. We need to be in total and complete surrender. But I think because we use it so much, sometimes we check out from that and we say, well, yeah, I've surrendered to God. I want God to have complete authority in my life. And we just check out from that rather than making it real to us, rather than really meaning it when we say it to God. But David, it seems, is all in with that phrase. And he wants to be in total surrender to who God is. This passage of scripture, this psalm, David wrote in complete vulnerability and complete openness, but he wrote it not in his personal journal just for him and God. He wrote it with intention of it being used in worship. That's what the psalms are. They are uh, passages uh, that were written uh, to be used in the temple for worship. And he wrote this because, uh, I think God directed him to write this because there is this truth that we as the people of God need to, we need to understand that there are, there are right thoughts about God. And we need to correct the little lies that Satan puts in our lives and leads us into distraction instead of in the way of everlasting. And so I want to address a couple of those real quick. First, Satan often tells us that we are forgotten, that we don't matter, that we're insignificant. And he convinces us, convinces us of that in many different ways. But that is oftentimes a message that we hear that we really don't matter. 
But I want to correct that little lie with this simple truth that God says that we are known and not forgotten. We are known and not forgotten by God. Every one of us is known by him. At the very beginning of this psalm, we read about that. And David, he says, God, you have already searched me. I am known by you, is what he's saying. I am not insignificant. I am not forgotten. I am, I am known by you. You have searched me and you know me. And then in verse 2, he expands on that. You know when I sit and when I rise up, you perceive my thoughts even from afar. And then he goes on to say, you discern when I go out and when I, when I lie down. You are familiar with all of my ways before a word is ever even spoken from my tongue. You know it completely. You see, David is saying to the people of God, you are not forgotten. You are not insignificant. You are known by the Almighty. We serve an amazing and an awesome God who is, who is everywhere at all times and is all-powerful. Those are, those are simple statements. But to understand that he had such power to create all of the cosmos and all of the world around us and everything that you can think or imagine, God knows and has managed all of that. And yet, he knows you personally and cares deeply about every one of us. And the Bible is exhaustive about, their, there's, about this. There are so many passages of Scripture I could use to reiterate this, this very fact that God knows us personally. The New Testament tells us, Jesus himself tells the, the disciples that God even knows the very number of hairs that are upon your head. Uh, just to, to give us an understanding of how much he knows us. It's not because... He wants to keep track of arbitrary numbers. He knows us that intricately. He knows you. You are not forgotten. You are known by the Creator God who loves you exceedingly. I go to this uh, story in the New Testament. Jesus told it as a parable to his disciples and to those around him. And he, he actually is mostly speaking to the Pharisees, actually. And he tells this story uh, of, about a shepherd. Uh, who, who has a flock of sheep, and, and that flock of sheep contains a hundred sheep in it, and, and he brings them into the fold one day, and he notices he's counting the sheep, and he says, wait a minute, there's only 99 here. And so what does he do? He locks the 99, he leaves them where they're at in the, in the enclosure, and he goes off searching for far and wide to find that one that is missing. This is a demonstration about how much God knows you. You are not forgotten. He will pursue you no matter where we go, no matter where we wander. He pursues us. In the seven I am statements in the Gospel of John where Jesus gives an I am this and he describes himself. In the seven of those, he says, I am the good shepherd and my sheep know my voice. He, he, he knows us intricately. He cares for us. And I don't know about you, I don't know if you've bought into that lie that you are forgotten or that you don't matter or that you're insignificant, but God does not agree with that assessment. You are known. Hashtag John chapter 10 verse 14, you can look that up later. You are known by the creator God. You are known and loved and cared for. You are not forgotten. Satan also tends to tell us another lie that we are, we are in this alone in our world. That you might have people around you, absolutely, but, but really it's all about your own strength and your own power, your own ability, your own, your own uh, willingness to, to dig in and, and to do, and you have to create and be and form yourself. But Jesus says to us, and, and David reiterates to us, no, no. You are not alone. You are together. We are together. You are not alone. In this passage of Scripture, again, uh, David, he starts to write about this, and he, he kind of gives us this demonstration, this illustration of the fact that we are not alone. It's not only that God knows us, but he is always right there with us. Verse 5 says, You hem me in, behind me and before me. Uh, hemming isn't a word we use a lot uh, in, our, in our world today. It's kind of a word that's losing significance and meaning. And I'm not talking about the hem in your pants or something of that nature. That's a different kind of hem. Uh, but you hem me in means you guard around me. Kind of like a fence would. 
Um, But in this particular illustration, uh, David is talking about how God goes in front of us and behind us. He is always right there. He continues on to say, he goes, you have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge, it's too wonderful for me to understand just how much you're there, God. It's hard for me to understand. It's too lofty for me to attain that. And then he goes on and he says, you know, in verse 7 and following, where can I go to even get away from God? The place doesn't exist. Stephen Moy paraphrase. Uh, He says, you know, I can go and I can flee from your presence. You're still there. I can go to the lofty mountains. You're still there. I can go to the very depths. You're still there. I can hide in the night. You're still there. Nothing hides me from you. And David, he's just correcting that course of the lie that we tend to believe that we are alone. And God says, no, you're not. I am right here with you. Jesus says it this way to his disciples, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. Or in Matthew chapter 28, that great commission, go therefore into all the world, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching those to uh, obey everything that I have commanded you, and then the promise, and lo, I am with you always, even until the very end of the world. Seems ironic that he says that as he's saying goodbye to them, right? But then we have the gift of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, through us, for us. Paul writes it this way in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. When we think that we have hit rock bottom and we think we can't do anything else because we've been trying in our own strength, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that there is no temptation taken us but what is common to mankind, but God is faithful. And he does not allow you to be tempted above what you are able, but with every temptation, he makes a way of escaping it. God is right there with you, walking through that storm, walking in the middle of everything else that is crashing around you. You are not alone. We are in relationship with him. We are together with him. You can check out hashtag Psalm 46, 1 through 3, if you want more verses on this, but there's many, many others. You are not alone. You are not alone. No matter how much you think so sometimes, he is there. No matter how much you feel like you have reached your end, he is right there to carry us and move with us. Another psalm, since we've been in the psalms the last couple of weeks, Another psalm, Psalm 23, says that even when we go through the very valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil for your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You are with us, God. We are not alone. We are together. And then another piece of this puzzle, this forgotten truth that we oftentimes buy into the lie that Satan whispers to us, this little lie of Life is meaningless. You are meaningless. There is no purpose for you. And God says, no, you are purposed. You have a purpose in this world. I have empowered you. I have loved you. You have a a, a meaning behind you. You are not meaningless. In this passage of Scripture, we come to it. As we've looked through uh, so far and we've seen all of these different things, and even as David is describing how God has, has crafted us, we see the very purpose coming out. In verse 13, you have created my inmost being. You have crafted me together in my mother's womb. You have made me the way that I am. And I will praise you because I am fearfully and I am wonderfully made. That is a statement of God's design on your life with purpose. You were not made the way that you are on accident. And let me just maybe give a little sidebar of another lie that's not part of this. This is a bonus, okay? This is an add-on. We oftentimes buy into the lie that God messed up when he made us, that somehow we're less than. Somehow we don't measure up to the world around us, and we buy that little lie oftentimes, and we have self-esteem low self-esteem that beats us up. And you know what? God doesn't believe that for a minute. God did not create you as an accident. He didn't mess up when he designed you the way that you are. When he gave you your gifts and talents, he didn't short you in any way, shape, or form. He created you exactly who you are with your personality on purpose to have an impact in this world, 
to walk with him and to show the world a little bit more of his nature and his character. You're not a mistake. Matter of fact, it's pretty arrogant of us to tell God that he made a mistake when we look at our own lives. That's just a little sidebar for you guys. The truth of it is, though, even as we unpackage this and see that God, he has created us fearfully. He has created us wonderfully. Your works, God, are beautiful. They're wonderful. It's not for me to tell you you botched it because you did a great job, even when I don't feel it. Verse 15 continues on, and David says, My form, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. You wove me together in the depths of the earth. You crafted me to be who I am. Your eyes saw even my unformed body. And all the days ordained for me were written in your book before I even breathed the first of them. That's pretty amazing. Another passage of scripture says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans for a hope and a future. You see, you have a purpose. You are a purposed person. You are not uh, living a meaningless life without value. Instead, God puts great value in who you are. He crafted you to be that person. He has given you the power and the ability to live in this world and impact other people's lives because he has crafted you the way that you are on purpose. Never buy Satan's little lie that you don't matter. Never buy Satan's lie that you're not equipped well enough or that you're less than. Never buy Satan's lie that that there's nothing for you that you can contribute because it's just not true. It's just not true. So what's my purpose? Well, I can't tell you exactly what God's going to call you to, exactly where God's going to lead you, because he calls us all uniquely and individually. But I can give you the overall purpose, that the framework in which everything we do needs to fall into. You see, in John chapter 13, and this, by the way, if you're ever wondering, is my absolute favorite chapter in the entire Bible, John chapter 13. I refer to it often. John chapter 13, Jesus, he's gathered in that upper room with his disciples. You know, it's that night where he's about to be arrested and he's going to be crucified the next day and the future is hard at that moment for him. We know that because he cries out later to God to take the cup from him. And in that moment, John, the disciple, he captures it really well. In John chapter 13, at the very beginning, he says that Jesus now wanting to show the disciples the fullness of his love. He starts to serve them, the washing feet, and we know the story. And then we understand that the Last Supper takes place, and there is the breaking of bread, there is the sharing of the, of the, of the cup, and all of this sort of thing. And the disciples, who have just been given an insight into just how much God loves them, Miss it completely, just like we often do. Uh, we, we read that they start arguing amongst each other about which one of them is the best, which one of them is going to have the most uh, lofty position in Jesus' kingdom someday, and, and how they're going to rank in the world, and all of these things. They start to argue amongst each other about being the greatest. And Jesus, he shakes his head in pure frustration in my mind's eye. It says, you are missing it completely. That's not in John chapter 13, by the way. That's in my mind's eye. But then he starts to teach them once again. And in verses 34 and 35, he tells them their purpose. It's no secret. It's not complicated. It's not hard to understand. It is simple. Love. Always without explanation, without qualification, without hesitation, love. Love God with all of your heart, mind, and soul. We hear that echoing in this, but love your neighbor as yourself. Matter of fact, Jesus, in that passage of Scripture, verses 34 and 35, his focus is on loving each other. Love, always. God's purpose for you in your life, no matter what direction he leads you, no matter where you find yourself, is to always love others as Christ would love them. 
Matter of fact, in verse 35, he goes on to say that the world will really know who I am as God when you finally start to do that, when you love each other. Paul, later on in the book of Romans, he, he, he's addressing this, and he's, he, he says it a little differently, but I, I like the way he says it. He says, let no debt remain outstanding amongst you. He's talking about money, right? No. Accept the debt to continue to love each other. That debt is never paid off keep paying in. Never stop making payments on that one. Continue to love one another. See, your life is not meaningless. It is not without purpose. That person that you encounter at your workplace or at your school or in your community or in your family, God has put them in your life on purpose so that you can love them. So that you can love them not with your own ability, but with the love of God. Again, you can take a look at Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17, hashtag Isaiah 117 later. God has given you great purpose. He didn't just put things in motion and say, okay, now make the best of it. He's there walking with us. He never leaves us. He knows us intricately, and he has a purpose for your life. He has a purpose for each and every one of us in our lives. So God, I thank you for your love that never fails, never runs out. There's no limit. When somebody else uses it, doesn't mean I miss out. God, your love is greater than. So God, I just pray that you would help us to not believe the lies that we have so often been told by the world around us the words of Satan trying to convince us that we are alone, that we are unknown, and that we have no meaning. But God, help us to believe the truth, who you are. You know us deeply. You have packaged us uniquely. You never leave us. You never forsake us. You're always right there with us. And God, you have called us to be your sons and your daughters, to live in a world in a way that shows them who you are, and in so doing, we get to experience who you are even greater. So help us to be all that you've called us to be. Help us to walk and surrender to who you are, and help us to have that prayer that David had at the end, and we say, God, look into my life, and if there is anything offensive, if there is anything in the way, deal with that. Call me out on it, God. Call me out on it, and then lead me into your way, everlasting. So it's in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit that I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.